Welcome to That's a Reach podcast, where we sit down to talk through questions about the Bible, theology, the gospel, and more, and how they influence your everyday life. You may have had these questions yourself, so we hope you find this conversation encouraging and clarifying in your pursuit of Jesus. Hey, everybody. Welcome to That's a Reach podcast. Um, my name is Taylor, not to be confused with Taylor number one, but Taylor number two. We've got a few questions for you today, and so we're going to start with the first one. How do I deal with feelings of rejection in a godly way? I'm going to assume, uh, based on our context, that that is probably a dating question. Uh, but I also think that you can, uh, on a general whole, you need to learn how to deal with those types of things because there's stuff in life where we're going to get rejected, like trying to apply for jobs or uh, you know, trying to grow in friendship and there's even something that we that we have to deal with within our evergreen culture where we have a lot of discipleship that we have going on sometimes a discipleship relationship doesn't work out and that's okay not everyone has to be bff uh forever in this life and so just learning to deal with rejection in general uh is an important thing and i'd say my first bit of advice is learning uh, an eternal perspective on things. Because when we, with our short-sighted human mindset, we think about stuff in, in such a short, narrow way, uh, but God sees such a much larger picture. And that's a lot of, uh, I was having a conversation with someone the other day, even about money. And that's one of the, the things that Jesus tells us about in the Sermon on the Mount is talking about having a, an eternal perspective when it comes to our time and our resources. But I even say the same thing with our relationships and our feelings and stuff, having an eternal perspective Uh, and shifting your mindset on those things is one of the ways to, in a godly way, uh, deal with rejection uh, and not be kind of stuck. We we feel stuck in our, in our feelings in the moment. We feel stuck in our short sightedness as being, you know, finite humans, but God allows us through the Holy spirit, through reading of the scriptures to gain a eternal perspective. And I think that's, that'd be my first bit of advice on a broad scale of how to deal with rejection. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's also a a value question here because uh, part of rejection is like it takes it takes like a huge uh, shot at your value, Mm -hmm. like and what you think makes you valuable. That's why that's part of why breakups are hard, right? It's not just like you lose this person that you were close to, but also it's like you're not worth keeping, or like you know, or even just your identity is under threat. Like you were that person's boyfriend or girlfriend, and now you're now you know what are you, right? And so I think that there's, um, you know, a valuable prayer is, is God show me what makes me valuable, right? Because you get to a place where you realize that the things that make you valuable are not, not the things about you, not almost like the things that can be taken away, if you will. The, the reason that you have value is because you're creating God's image and you are, uh, and you're a walking, talking billboard for Jesus Christ, right? And so those things give you value. And that's, what is that? That's your ability to worship God. Yeah. And so I think that there's, um, you know, you start, you start attaching your identity and your value to your job, your career, your degree path, your significant other. And then when those things don't work out, your value gets stolen. And so I think there's a, you know, I think you're right. There's like, um, this general version of this, which is like, um, which is like, look, you know, having that perspective from that heavenly realm, from that eternal perspective, but also then taking that to the specific place. Cause it's kind of like saying like, what's your value? Well, to glorify God. And it's like, great. But what is like Matt O'Mealy's specific contribution yeah. to that? Well, ask God what makes you valuable, what he yeah. sees in you specifically. And, and this goes back to like every issue we ever have, which is the wrong answer is to not take that directly into God's presence. Yeah. It's the only way you lose. Because no matter what you're dealing with, even if you're even if you're making like you're blaming God for what you're dealing with, fine. Go tell him that. Go sit in his presence and say to God, I like I blame you. And let him work that out in you. You know? And the reason we don't do that is because we don't actually want it worked out. We want to sit in that feeling. We want to sit in that place. And so I think that there's something to be said for you're okay, you're dealing with rejection. Okay, f- fine. Go take that to God and and ask him to fix it. Yeah. You know, sit with him on it. You know, so 
I don't know. That that would be the direction I, I would I think go. that's that also applies to the finding an internal perspective because from God's perspective, how does he view you? Right. Does he think you're not worthy of yeah, love? Yeah, right, right. You know, does he think you're not worthy of his time to be a friend or whatever? Does he not have a specific job or path for you? And if you, if you start finding that security in the way God sees you mm-hmm. and seeing yourself from that eternal perspective, seeing your value in the things that are eternal and in the way God sees you, the hits from... The external things, not that they don't hurt, but they're significantly easier to deal with. Yeah, you know? yeah. It doesn't it doesn't remove the pain of rejection of that we deal with in this life, but it doesn't rock us and send us into a spiral mm-hmm. like it can when we don't have that eternal perspective and, f- and we forget who God says we are. Right. In that same way. And I think and I think the rejection can be applied to dating, like we've talked about, but also rejection in anything in our lives, and it's like the perspective of, are we walking in God's will? Are we walking yeah. in what he has for us? Because if we are, then the feelings of rejection aren't going to be it. You're going to see it and view it as a learning moment, not just uh, woe is me in, in a way. So, yeah. Yeah. And I think the, in that regard too, changing your perspective and understanding the value that God places on you will also lessen the amount of time that you are struggling with mm-hmm. it as mm-hmm. well. Um, yeah, I hope that's helpful yeah. uh, without knowing all the specifics right. of the context. Right. Uh, I think just in general, those those are the areas that I would point people towards. Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll jump into question number two. Please, please explain spiritual warfare. I'm so confused. I love the I love the two <clears throat> pleases. The double. Please <laughs> explain this to me. <laughs> crying yeah. emoji, crying emoji. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would say, uh, I mean, without getting into the weeds, and so much of it is speculative. The reason that it's it it stays a question, and it stays <laughs> the way it is, is because in a lot of instances, the Bible is uh, not specific on it. There's a lot of things, just I think in general, on the the overly spiritual, supernatural realm that the Bible's not super specific on because how helpful and productive would that be for us as as created beings to to be, you know, paralyzed with confusion and fear of, of a supernatural realm. Uh, but the Bible does show that it does exist. Uh, Old Testament and New Testament, spiritual warfare exists, uh, demons, angels. Uh, it, it is clear that that is a thing, but I also don't think it is a thing because the Bible doesn't overly emphasize it. I don't think it's a thing that we need to be overly emphasizing as well. There's different streams of Christian orthodoxy and denominations and stuff that will overly ignore it or overly focus on yeah, it. Right, right, right. And the healthier thing is to acknowledge that it exists and not be scared of it, uh, but also not allow ourselves to go down a road of unhealthy fascination or unhealthy fear about it. So what is spiritual warfare? I mean, there's a lot that can be said. I, I think we even talked about some of the ideas of where demons and stuff come from. When we talked about Enoch and other extra biblical uh books you know several episodes ago but uh what what is our what is our enemy it's the world the flesh and the devil is what we battle against and the enemy through through the uh demons through the fallen angels whatever you want to call them uh he is working to manipulate uh the world and the flesh against us so our our fleshly desires are our, our, our weaknesses to, to trip us up uh, or uh, manipulating the lost non-believing world to make the world in general suffer. Uh, just to point out some resources, I think we did the same thing before, but uh, the Bible Project has good deep dives into different aspects about uh, what are the spiritual beings, what is the heavenly council, all those types of questions. They do some good deep dives on that that kind of help to, you know, for me, it was all these big questions about what is that. I was like, okay, I, I see what's going on there now when I read these things. It's connecting some dots. Uh, but what the what the enemy in the supernatural realm is doing is manipulating. We see that through the Old Testament is manipulating the powers of, of government for the destruction of humanity. It's manipulating the relationships around where God is trying to work, trying to use those relationships to pull people down, to distract them. Uh, that's what... A lot of the the reason that God 
didn't want the, I mean, there's many reasons that God didn't want the Israelites to, to, you know, go after idols and stuff, but that is one of the things that was a spiritual, supernatural, demonic distraction uh, for them. And so uh, what is spiritual warfare? You know, we, we don't believe that uh, a, a Christ follower, a true disciple can be up uh, possessed, possessed right. internally and controlled, but we do believe that they can be oppressed when the when doors are open when there is bad habits when there is uh bad relationships where there is wrong ways of thinking that's what the enemy uses to manipulate and to to drag that person down uh if you haven't read c.s lewis's fiction book of the screw tape letters it's a good example of the idea of what it looks like for the enemy through the flesh and through the world around them and through relationships to try and drag a person down and to keep them from coming to faith uh so that as it is a fiction uh, book, but it is a good example of of what it looks like when a person is being manipulated by the enemy. Yeah, yeah, and I think it, it's important to think. So that I have two two things on this. One is it's important to remember that there are there tend to be kind of two tactics in this. There's surprise and intimidation, mm-hmm. and so in our culture, what we see a lot more of is surprise because the enemy has a massive benefit in our culture because we're so smart mm-hmm. and we're so scientific. That so smart. demons yeah. <laughs> can't can't possibly exist, yeah. right? And so what he does is he lets us live in that world where mm-hmm. where he doesn't confront us a lot in that those open ways and allows him to kind of always be meddling in our in our lives with us pretending he's not there, right? Yeah. You can't fight an enemy you don't think exists. Yeah. And then if you go, you know, you, you hear stories from the mission fields of of missionaries confronting very blatant example examples of demons mm-hmm. and spiritual warfare why because in those cultures where you know you know if you're living in a remote part of uh, uh, the world with a witch doctor it's like they believe in demons they believe in yeah. spiritual warfare so the enemy in those settings is working through intimidation and it's more yeah. more oppressive and overpowering yeah um, when it comes to things like that like witch doctors you know modern witchcraft whatever you want to think of people are like oh look a thing happened Therefore, it must be real. Sure. You can even look at the example of Moses going against, you know, Pharaoh's sorcerers in in the book of Exodus. Yeah, they were faking stuff. Yeah, they were faking stuff. But but how did that happen? Like, there's some instances where it was probably just demonic influence, sure. where they they have uh, some flexibility, where they are manipulating right. the world right. in order to trick people because they they want at, at you know, at all possible, all, all ways possible. They're trying to keep our eyes off of the right. one true God right. and the way that things actually are. And so they're trying to distract, they're trying to intimidate, they're yeah. trying to confuse. Yeah, and, and that and that kind of goes into, there's a practical application side of this. And one of the things that I, I kind of, I'm always telling people like whatever end of the, of the extremes that you're on, mm-hmm. you probably need to go back towards center, right? Mm-hmm. And so there's this level at which people... You know, first of all, we don't know how many angels and demons there are. We're told yeah. great multitudes and that, you know, roughly a third of them became fallen, right? So we don't know what those numbers are. Is it possible that everywhere you go in your entire life, there's angels and demons like right around you, you know, fighting it out, having these spiritual... Yeah, it's possible. It's also possible that you live most of your life without encountering angels and demons, right? Like, yeah. I don't think I don't think that the... I'm not saying it's wrong to think this, but I don't really think that there's, you know, we have like this one guardian angel falling us around or we have this one demon that's trying to fight in our life. Yeah. And so there's this there's this balance because you have people on one end who are like, that stuff's not real. Well, the practical application there is, yeah, because you don't recognize that it is real, you are suspect to being ambushed by it. But then there's this other side where every single thing that happens in your life is somehow the demon's fault. The demon that's following mm-hmm. me around is causing this bad thing to happen. I only I only sinned because that demon was right there tempting me. It's like, okay, let's stop for a second. First of all, James says that part of the reason you sin is because you have evil desires yeah. internally, right? And you got to think about it like this. The enemy doesn't have to be present in every situation. Think about it in warfare, leaving a minefield somewhere. You don't have to watch a minefield. You can lay it out. And then wait for the enemy to to walk into it and trip up, and you don't have have to be there for it. Well, the enemy is laying mines all over the place. Yeah, there's mines everywhere. I mean, every time you open up your computer, there's a minefield. Mm-hmm. Every time you go out in public, there's a minefield. And so, to a certain extent, could there be a very active presence in your life? Yeah, absolutely. Also, 
Don't blame everything on that demon. You're responsible for... Sometimes spiritual warfare is just your spirit warring against your flesh. Yeah. That's the spiritual warfare. The Bible warfare. also points that out yes. excessively. Yes. Yeah. And so that's the thing. is like I would say if you're on the end where everything in your life you attribute to the nearest angel and demon, maybe you need to take a good hard look in the mirror. You yeah. know? And if you're on the other end where you don't think that angels and demons are... That's just a fairy tale. Well, then you need to... You need to look at the Bible and see that it testifies that this is a, a reality, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's not something it's not something to be scared of. It's not something to be obsessed about. Uh, and that isn't I, we're not saying that we have all the answers and mm-hmm. that we have it right. But, you know, I've I've seen some things. I, I know people personally that have dealt with some things both in America and on the mission field. Uh, you know, I, I believe it's very real. Yeah. But but like Taylor said, I don't think it's like this there's not this constant thing where the enemy and some people try and over spiritualize it and like, well, if you're not being spiritually attacked, I guess you're not a real threat to the devil. Right. It's like, no, don't, don't beat yourself up to where I, well, I got to go start, you know, being some crazy street preacher. So the devil will attack me. Like, no, don't we're, this is not, you know, just with spiritual warfare with so many other things in life, it's not some, you know, mystical algebra equation that we're trying to figure out uh, to, to solve this, to battle the enemy. Uh, don't don't think that way either. That's that's not helpful. Uh, but but spiritual warfare is is very real. Uh, the enemy does not want us to be uh, what I say that you know what, what I see in scripture. Uh, Peter says this that that as we grow in maturity, we are effective and productive, and the enemy does not want us to be effective right. and productive. So if he can confuse us, if he can scare us, uh, if he can even just allow us to remain in ignorance thinking, well, he's not going to do anything. There's no real, real danger to that. Then we're still going to be ineffective and unproductive. We are in a battle. The, the scriptures tell us to, to be ready for battle and our enemy is not flesh and blood. It is the principalities and powers of the air. That, that is what we battle yes. against. Uh, so it is a very real thing, but it's not something to be scared of because we fight from a position of, of winning a, win, mm-hmm. a position of success and victory, uh, We've talked about this a lot, I think even within Reach, and I know Michael has mentioned this before in uh, recent Sunday sermons, uh, the, Jesus says that the, the gates of hell will not prevail over those that know him, those that are following after him. The gates of hell, that means that they're on the, d- the defense. Yeah. They're, they're backpedaling. And so we, we don't need to be in a position of fear. So as we please, please explain spiritual warfare, uh, the main thing is it is real, but we don't need to be scared because as a Christ follower, you fight from a position of victory and yeah. God has the ultimate victory in the right. end. Right. So anything to add, Taylor, too? No, that's good. Cool, that's man. That's good. <laughs> okay. Last question. Should we seek global Christian hegemony culturally and or politically or should we persevere in person to person influence while recognizing that the world will get more and more rotten with sin? Yeah. So it's an eschatology question. Sure. And th- there is a level of which this is uh, almost almost like a uh, false choice. Right. There's like um, yeah. so. So to answer the question, like in the most simplified format, like, no, we absolutely should not per- like pursue a Christian hegemony. Right. Yeah. That's like that's totally missing the point. Right. And I. I. I think that everywhere you see that in human history, like literally every culture that has ever been predominantly Christian, you just end up with this completely opposite-ended problem, which is tons of people think they're Christians and they're not, right? Yeah. So it's it's no better. Like, yeah. it's like, it may be easier, and it, well, and it is, and that's what leads to the apathy that mm-hmm. is people not sharing the gospel and people not hearing the gospel because everybody's a Christian. Look around. Like, it's all Christianity. Like, what that's called Christendom. Mm-hmm. Right. That's not that is absolutely not what we're supposed to pursue. Right. OK. But the the reason I say it's like in a sense of false choice is because, yes, you absolutely should be pursuing person to person interactions and the spread of the gospel or even like, yeah. you know, I mean, you could say like preaching is not a person to person interaction. Right. That's but that's still spreading the gospel. But here's the here's the reason I say like it's not it's not quite that simple. There's an implicate. Now, I'm not. I'm not accusing whoever asked that question of this necessarily. There, There is almost an implication in this conversation that, well, if Christians would focus on the gospel, then they shouldn't worry about anything else. Okay, but here's the thing. God cares about the physical world we live in. Yeah. So even though the highest pursuit is the gospel, there is a level at which we are called, like, honestly, how effective is the gospel if we tell everybody, like, we don't care about your physical well-being or needs at all. It's why we 
bring food to starving people and share the gospel. It's why we should participate in politics. It's why Christians should join militaries in times of conflict. You know, and now there's obviously so many implications of that like yeah. if if I if I you know you want to point it like Iraq and Afghanistan. Okay, well now we need to have a debate. We need to have a debate about existential crisis versus a war that maybe we shouldn't be in in the first place. There's so many elements there, right? Yeah. But it's like, do I think Christians should have joined the army when? Hitler was literally taking over the world? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I absolutely think Christians should have been a part of that, right? And so I think when you talk about things like this, there's a level at which should we, you know, vote for, th- uh, you know, for instance, against things like abortion? Yeah, absolutely, because there's souls at stake. There is, you know, what about the gospel to all of those unborn children, right? Yeah. And so there's a level at which, yeah, yeah, no, we should not pursue a Christian hegemony, for sure. But that also does not Im- imply that we abdicate pursuing goodness in the world for the sake of the gospel, right? The go- and it really, it comes down to this. Where's your, what's your hope in? Is your hope in the gospel? Then even in your voting, in your, in your view of world events, how does that further the gospel? And at the same time, uh, why sh- why would I say no to a Christian hegemony, even though that would make things so much easier for Christians? Because my hope isn't in some political order or Christian culture. Yeah, my hope is in the the gospel being spread. But I'm going to spread the gospel alongside of meeting needs in a physical way. Yeah, know? for sure. And I think uh, the reason I said I think it's kind of an eschatology problem too, because some people think, well, uh, it, it used to be popular. Uh, it's post-millennial right where they thought that the world would get better and better because christians yeah, would right. win and win and win right and, and then world war one and world war two yeah. happened and then it became less popular yeah but it's been it's becoming popular thought again it's a more recent thing where it's coming back up again we need a world war three no yeah well, yeah it. exactly yeah gotta just keep people in their place right <laughs> you no know, that'd be terrible but uh it's the idea i think it also brings up the question and this is gonna you know probably open up more cans of worms that we don't need to do today but then it's the question of the problem of evil because i think the answer to the problem of evil is going back to what we were talking about earlier even with talking about rejection and the spiritual warfare that humanity is you know no one is righteous no not one like we we are broken and there is no end to the gratuitous amounts of evil and violence that we can come up with on our own yeah and so i don't think that even a culture that is having a spiritual revival is going to overcome the brokenness that is in the world because i don't think that's the plan it's not yeah, like right. it's we're not supposed to get everything you know as good as we can get it kind of a, a, right. a b plus before god comes back <laughs> right. and he'll kind of like push us over the edge right. of goodness right like it's gonna be there's gonna be lots of because like where's the church growing right now where it's oppressed in china and in the middle east it's it's booming in underground churches because we don't need an easy time we don't need uh, a comfortable time in order for Christianity to spread. Right. And so a a global Christian hegemony is not going to make Christianity easier. It makes a it makes us apathetic. Yeah, apathetic. In, in right. our context, growing up in the Bible belt, we you know, it's starting to, you know, in, in my generation, uh, older than a lot of our young adults, I'm a I'm a middle millennial, uh <clears throat> everyone knew all the Bible answers because everyone's grandma forced them to go to VBS. Right. right. And so it was really hard to evangelize people that are my age. I'm, I'm 39 because everyone knows the basic Bible answers. They prayed their prayer 10 times in a row at, v- at VBS and they're still, you know, not right, followers. Right. They're still, you know, living for themselves. Yeah, I have friends that grew out of it. Yeah, exactly. Like, they really? grew out of it. Yeah. <laughs> those types of things. I, and I'm hearing that less and less uh, with the younger 20 somethings that we deal with because I think our culture has has grown out of, like of post-Christian. being, yeah, we're, we're becoming post-Christian in that regard. So the, the bubble of the Bible belt has, has been popping a little bit in that regard. And some people are freaking out about it. Uh, I mean, is that sad? Because there's more, there's more obvious outward sin happening. Sure. I guess, but it makes it more clear. There's a clear delineation yeah, right. between salvation well, and not. I remember <laughs> in, in like my early high school, middle school time frame thinking how do you live like a christian in a way that doesn't look like the world because everybody kind of lived like a yeah. christian too you know to it my immature eyes right yeah but now it's like uh i can give you 10 10 things right off the top of my head that my non-christian friends will go do every week that i'm not gonna go do because that's not who i'm called to be you know yeah. and that's 
and what is that? That's not a moral superiority like, oh, look at me. That is just saying like, hey, there's a clear dividing line. Yeah. The question becomes, why do you act like that? Well, because Jesus saved me yeah. and I'm going to live according to that reality. Yeah. You know, why don't you go drink and party all the time? Yeah. Well, because I'm not trying to fill an empty void in yeah. my life. I right. don't need that feeling. I don't need to to escape because the reality I'm in, knowing that I'm a son of the father and that I have my Christian brothers and sisters with me, I don't need to escape that reality. Yeah. No matter how difficult the world is around me, I don't need to go yeah. party. Yeah, and 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 to and to be clear, kind of the implication, it's it's almost more confusing when you look at it from like a political angle. Like, should how how involved in yeah. politics should Christians be? And, and again, my question is, where's your hope? Right? Mm-hmm. Like you you participate, but you don't put your hope in. But like an easier example of this is ask yourself why almost every hospital in the world has a Christian foundation. Yeah, because Christians went and built hospitals all over the place to help people and 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 care for people. Well, those were believers who put their hope in the gospel and also said we need to care and love for people yeah. and like have a love for people that manifests in actually treating disease and fixing you know malady you know like actually helping them yeah, you know yeah. and so it's like if your hope is in the gospel, that should drive you to meet some physical needs. And it's not just the Mother Teresas of the world that right. are doing that. No, it's, right. It's the normal Christians. And even though a lot of the hospitals that are named, you know, Mercy, whatever, and Baptist Hospital, this, a lot of them have been kind of like sold off and now they're corporate and they're all that. Like co-opted. Uh, they have been. But when you look even at the statistics in America and globally, it's still Christians are the ones that give the majority towards charity. Yeah, right. And it's not saying that lost people don't give generously. They do. Yeah. Like giving generously does not, it's not like the marker of being a, a Christ follower. Yeah. But. And, it, and actually this question, like this is why some of those hospitals got sold off is because there was a, in, during the conservative resurgence when the Baptists like basically gave up a bunch of their schools and seminaries mm-hmm. and and hospitals was because they were like we're just gonna we're gonna take the gospel to every nation it's like hey as a matter of fact hospitals were a great way of taking the gospel places yeah, <laughs> it's like yeah. a really good method you yeah. know and we've also talked about this before but it was probably a misstep on their part it was to do that uh, it was. because humans like to pendulum swing yes oh we got this thing wrong it must be the exact the, opposite the whole <laughs> opposite direction yeah. yeah and that was the thing is like that that was a misstep because we it was short sighted yeah. and you know part of it again we're told to live in the last days what that that means is live in a way that says Jesus could come back at any moment mm-hmm. what that doesn't mean is because Jesus is gonna like it's like that uh, what's that scene in Parks and Rec with the guys who think that the oh yeah they aliens go, gonna yeah. show up <laughs> and so they're like spending their money because and that's it the, Christ, the Christians like, got oh, this yeah, place I'll sell it to you. right yeah, <laughs> and Christians got that place where they were like oh Jesus is gonna come back uh-huh. any day now so we can sell off all our hospitals and sell off all our seminaries and it's like hold hold on like but if Jesus doesn't happen to come back tomorrow we're still gonna need those things to yeah. share the gospel you know and so it's like yes. Focus on sharing the gospel, but understand that there are ways, there are methods that increase the mm-hmm. reach of the gospel. Yeah. You know, one, one, one recent example that I can point to that uh, we're part of, you know, the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, our churches and the the SBC in America has uh, was a DR disaster relief. Yep. And, you know, in Oklahoma, we have lots of tornadoes. We see those guys come out whenever there's a tornado. They're usually wearing yellow shirts that say like what? you know, churches they're from and all that. Uh, when I lived in New Orleans, uh, I moved there in 08, so three years after Katrina, and uh, I had heard about it as I was coming into the city, and I continued to hear and see it, but uh, people would talk about, non-believers would talk about the fact that the, you know, down in New Orleans, it's like the Catholic, like, archdiocese and the government, they're like, hey, you're supposed to fix all of our problems. Katrina happens, and both of them dropped the ball constantly but those Baptists in the yellow shirts, they would come in and they would fix everything in somebody's house for free and take care of them and ask for nothing. Yeah. And so they were like, so there was this article that was uh, like the, the seminary would point it out when they were recruiting people to go to, to seminary down there. They're like, hey, the gospel, we have an inroad right now because because Katrina, it softened people's hearts. It was a an atheist columnist in New Orleans wrote, hey, Apparently, the Catholic Church and the government can't fix it, so someone needs to call the Baptist to come and fix some problems. <laughs> uh, and so that's an example of of bringing the gospel by helping meet people's actual physical needs right. and then loving them as their neighbor and looking for opportunities to share right. Christ with right. them. That's what the hospitals were doing for, you know, generations, and uh, we continue in that that um, that philosophy when we when we come up with those types of solutions. Right. 
and allow the Lord to use us to bless people right, in right. that way and that physically. Can, and that can even extend to political activism to an extent, right? Yes, yeah. It's like don't don't think, well, I only care about the gospel, so I'm going to recede from having yeah. any interaction with the rest of the world in a way that might impact somebody's life, you mm-hmm. know? So. Yeah, we, we, you know, the Bible clearly, Old Testament and New Testament tells us to seek the good of our neighbors. Yeah, right. Uh, whether that was the Israelites in exile or whether that was Paul telling people to be a good neighbor, yeah. Jesus telling us to be a yeah. good neighbor, like seeking well, the good of our neighbor is is who we are. And you and you see, like, the, or the, the Israelites in exile, for instance, is a good, great example, like, they were supposed to build up the cities that yeah. they were in exile in. They were supposed to pray for them and hope for their best. Not, not just for the Israelites' benefit, yes. but for yes. everyone's benefit. Yes, and not just be like, yeah. these are our captors. I hope they die and yeah. we get to go home. It's like, no, that's not how we're called to live, you know. Exactly, yeah. So. Anything new from that's you, good. T2? I think, I think these <laughs> answers are going to help a lot of people. Yeah. So. Cool, cool, cool. But, hey, thanks for joining us on this episode of That's Reach Podcast. Um, please keep... Uh, submitting questions so we can have more podcasts and answer more questions. So, awesome. Awesome. Another one done. Peace. Well, hot dog. Thanks for joining us on That's a Reach. We are pastors and leaders from the Reach Young Adult Ministry at Evergreen Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And these questions come from those in our young adult community here. If you're from a different church and context, we hope you found the discussion beneficial and edifying as you pursue spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ in your culture and context.